Good day to everyone joining us, and welcome to today's XTalks webinar. Today's talk is entitled, Implementing Risk-Based Quality Management, Lessons Learned and Key Pathways to Compliance. My name is Tegan Versalotto, and I'll be your XTalks moderator for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, with time for a question and answer session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for future download. At this point, I'd like to thank Chaucer, who helped develop the content for this presentation. Chaucer is home to experts in creating value from digital transformation and data to improve lives. They've been supporting the life sciences sector as specialists for 30 years. Their consultants have firsthand experience with everything from R&D through to commercial. They understand the challenges that their clients face, as well as the opportunities for driving high impact change. They specialize in data and technology, data enabled operations and data driven transformation. Chaucer is recognized by the Financial Times as a leading digital consulting company. Their entrepreneurial and innovative approach to their clients' projects and programs sets them apart. They serve as their clients' trusted partner to ensure that even the most complex initiatives are delivered successfully. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Chris Fantelli has 28 years of experience working internationally with blue chip and small and medium enterprise organizations. Working as a consultant for the last 10 years, he has experience working in several different industries, including pharmaceuticals, energy, and aerospace. Chris is an accredited change agent and has worked closely with executive teams in portfolio and project management, developing and managing balanced scorecards, organizational alignment, and risk management. He holds an MBA and a Bachelor of Science in Engineering product design. And for our second speaker for today's event, Sarah Gunston is an experienced project and change manager who has helped companies add new processes and ways of working. Currently, she is the project and change management lead, working to add a risk management process and framework to ensure compliance with ICH E6 R2. Sarah has worked on a variety of projects, engaging with leaders at all levels, giving her hands-on experience with a range of change initiatives, cultures, leadership styles, and project management approaches. Her qualifications include APMG Change Management Foundation and Practitioner, Prince 2 Foundation and Practitioner, and Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt. So without any further ado, I would like to hand the mic and the presentation over to our first speaker for today, Chris. You may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Tegan, and good afternoon and good morning to everybody. Um, today, our agenda, we're going to briefly recap of the E6R2 guidance. Um, I'm not going to go into it in detail, it's been done many times before, but we will set up um, some context about what we're going to talk about, which is basically risk-based quality management and how we operationalize it. We have two case studies to share with you, real-life case studies that we'll be looking at um, the challenges and how we overcame those challenges. Our key focus is going to be on engagement and cultural change within the organizations. We'll take a look at technology as well and how we've used technology to overcome any challenges around engagement and cultural change. And there'll be a question and answer session at the end. So ICHE 6 r 2 This emphasizes a dynamic relationship and oversight requirements between the sponsor and the CRO. And we need to apply additional oversight to risk. The addendum in itself looks at two levels of risk, the system level, CROs, vendors, SOPs, facilities, etc., and also the study design level. With regards to system level, I think if you start looking into your organizations, there's many risk formats going on within the organization, whether it's business continu continuity, how we manage our vendors, you obviously have risk controls in your SOPs and your computer systems. But, but more relevant for this talk today is gonna to be the trial level and the study design and the protocol development and how we engage study teams and quality people into managing 
assessing risks, identifying risks, and also acting upon those risks. But key again is changing the culture within the organization and making sure that we are compliant within our clinical studies and more importantly that we can report the um, quality tolerance levels, quality tolerance levels and the risks and the deviations from those risks as we go forward. So it's important to remember that this work does have to be reported in the clinical study report and in particular quality tolerance limits defined for the top risks. We won't be going to detail of the QTLs other than defining some lessons in clarifying and demystifying some of the confusion we have experienced in delivering risk-based quality management. So we have two case studies to illustrate our findings and two different companies at different stages of growth, development and experience and maturity in delivering clinical trials, products to markets and also in managing risk. Sarah's Sarah will take us through the first case study, after which I'll bring to you my insight through a second company. These are real stories to respect. We have anonymized the organizations at their request. But it's not to be confused with risk-based monitoring, a process which occurs after the risk identification and assessment. So essentially, the process that we're going to talk today, risk-based quality management, is something that will drive risk-based monitoring which is probably a subject of another webinar later on. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Sarah, who's going to take us through case study one. Okay, so um, just to set the scene, I wanted to share the problem statement, the challenges, and the objectives of the project. So as you can see, the problem statement for this company was all around um, not being fully compliant with the regulatory expectations. So I've picked out what I think the three main challenges were with moving to this desired state where we could manage risk in a more proactive, consistent and compliant way. So for us, both at departmental and individual level, we found that people didn't necessarily understand the guidance and they were finding this quite confusing, which meant that they couldn't actually apply it effectively to their department. Also, although risk was being managed across trials, um, it was inconsistent and there wasn't a well communicated and formal process for this. And finally, probably the biggest challenge for us was this cultural change. So this was never just about embedding a new process. This was how do we actually get people to think in a different way and move from a reactive to a more proactive culture around managing risk. So with that in mind, I just wanted to pull out some of the main objectives which are on the screen. So as I've said, although risk was being managed, we were really starting from scratch regarding consistency and being fully compliant to regulations. So we really had to work with the business to establish an agreed strategy and framework. So to underpin this, we needed to create some tools, so it won't come as a surprise that that was a new SAP, and also an actual tool for how we were going to manage risk. As I've mentioned, there was this cultural shift, so we needed to move from this reactive to proactive way of managing risk. Once we had that framework and we knew what we needed to do, we needed to work on the communications and training to ensure that people understood what was coming and that they actually had the relevant skills and knowledge to be able to adopt it. And for this particular company, with the shift to more outsourced delivery models and their growing portfolio, we really needed to work on a clear formal escalation route up to senior leadership within clinical operations. So that's just a brief overview of the problem statement, the challenges and the objectives. So I'm going to spend the next three slides talking about the strategies we use to overcome some of those challenges. So the first challenge, as I've said, was this confusion around the guidance. So people were really struggling to understand things like what was a quality tolerance limit? You know, how would they define this? When was a risk critical versus other? And we found that this was a real blocker because people were just getting stuck at not being able to understand the guidance. So there was a few strategies that we used to try and overcome this. So firstly, we really wanted to break the guidance down and just make it as simple as possible. So we really took it back to basics. And um, rather than overwhelming people with all this new terminology, 
we ask them in really simple terms, you know, what is it that would stop your trial from being a success? So when you're thinking about patient safety and data integrity, what is it that would really stop your trial? And this then gave people their critical risk. And it gave them a way to start to be able to formulate their risk register with that simple question in mind. So once we had them kind of on the way of the process, we could support teams uh, with completing the rest of the risk register, having a think about some of those other things. And this really helped them in just breaking down that confusion. For us personally, we found some really great material from within the industry and we chose one particular webinar and with this webinar we ensured that people attending workshops had watched this so that there was a basic level of understanding this also helped us so as the facilitators and the trainers we understood people's general level baseline understanding so we could build on top of that and we also really encouraged some of our core project team to actually go and have a look at what was out there and you know see if there were things that we could utilize we were really conscious around using consistent language. So throughout all our communications and training, we made sure that it was the same language and the same terms that we were always using. And this really helped things become normal everyday language. You know, people didn't have that kind of panic around what's a QTL. It just became something that people understood. And we found that the more people talked about the terminology, actually the more people asked questions and that really helped with their understanding. We spent quite a lot of time initially ensuring that our core project team really understood the terminology and they really acted as SMEs and supported their peers and other stakeholders in understanding this. So we encouraged that group to attend workshops and really support peers as they were going through this process. And finally, once we'd simplified the process as much as we could and we had them those SMEs, we utilized a target, targeted communication strategy to ensure that the right people understood the guidance and the process. So we started with the CPMs and the core project team, and then we rolled it out to a wider audience. So as I've said, there wasn't actually a consistent approach at the time that this project started. So we needed to ensure that we designed the right approach that could be rolled out across the department to ensure regulatory compliance, but also it had to be fit for purpose for the company. So we started by establishing a core, a core cross-functional project team so they could support us throughout the project. So initially, they worked with us to conduct a landscape assessment. So we had a really clear idea of where the gaps were and then actually what we needed to do to action these. This team were great because they were engaged right from the start, but they also gave us that company knowledge, you know, those little bits of insight that we might not have known. And going forward, this group will become a network of risk management advocates, so they'll be there to provide ongoing support to teams. As expected, we had to do something around an SAP, and the decision we made was to write a new risk management in clinical trials SAP. So this went through many review cycles and a lot of iterations, but we worked really hard to keep this A, as simple as possible, but also really ensure it was written from the user perspective and that the company could stay, stay within compliance. When we launched the SAP, we launched it with a quiz, and that was mainly for us just to test that people were understanding what it was they were reading. We also had to develop the actual tool to manage the risk. So for us, um, this was a risk register that came um, as an Excel document. And, and the reason that we decided to go with Excel is the company are um, bringing in some new technologies later in the year. So we wanted to keep it as simple as possible to transition. So before we um, rolled this out, we spent a fair amount of time looking at industry best practice and really trying to utilize lessons learned to ensure that we had the best possible tool. We landed on something ultimately that worked really well for the business and importantly is compliant. So the Excel document contains quite a few different tabs. So the first tab on there is a guidance tab. And this goes into quite a lot of detail around actually how to fill out the risk register. And the feedback has been that this is really useful for people because actually when they come to complete this for the trial, it's good for them to have a reference point to go back to. 
The second tab splits down the risk categories and it provides teams with questions to consider when they start to think about risk identification. So initially our plan was that we would have core risks in there so that teams could actually utilize core risks. But we changed our mind on that because we wanted to use questions to really get people to think in the right way rather than just looking at core risks and potentially adapting that for their trial. The third tab on the document is the actual risk register, which is how they will document the risks they're managing. We've also got a version control tab on there because we wanted to make it really easy to see when the register was reviewed and also what changes were made. And finally, we've got a tab which has got some example risks on. And this is just to help teams understand the level of detail they could go into and just give them a little bit of extra support um, as they start on this process. So the tool was launched with the SOP and we have a feedback log so teams can feed in some of those um, bits of information as they start to use it. And then at a certain time point, we can look to see if we want to make those changes. We've also established a risk resource library, and this is um, an online library which includes supporting materials and examples to support teams and also promote continuous improvement. So some things that we've already developed are, um, we've done a core risk register for some of the phase one trials. So we were finding after some of the discussions that actually in early phase, a lot of the trials were experiencing similar risks. So we've created this risk register as a starter for them to use. We've also utilized a slide deck that one of the uh, clinical project managers developed with us. So they use this for their risk identification meeting and found it really useful. So we've put that in the library. So actually CPMs don't have to keep recreating the wheel. They can just utilize something that's already there. Going forward, there'll also be a library of lessons learned. So future teams can have a look at this as they start the process. The idea here is that actually it will reduce the likelihood that teams are experiencing the same issues over and over again. So we found that there's often barriers to completing lessons learned. People will say, you know, I don't have the time or my trial's over. So we've also got some information around why it's really important to do lessons learned and also some tips, again, just to support the CPMs and try and make it as easy as possible for them. And finally, we have established a core risk committee and their main purpose is to share risk management knowledge, lessons learned, and also really provide advice and guidance as subject matter experts. So the committee will own and maintain the resource library and ensure it remains fit for purpose. So for example, all the CPMs will send their lessons learned to the committee who will be able to review the output and decide which ones to include in a public folder. This is so that you know, the library doesn't become this overwhelming dumping ground. And the core risk committee also have a key responsibility in seeking out and implementing continuous improvement. So whether that's to the process, to the training, or to the supporting materials. So we've now got time for our first poll question. So I'm gonna hand back over to Tegan who will facilitate that. Perfect, thank you, Sarah. Yes, we just asked that our audience participates in this poll. So if you just look at your screen, I've just launched that for you. Uh, the question we're interested in having you guys answer is, to what extent does your organization utilize an effective risk committee? And to vote, all you have to do is select the answer that makes sense to you by simply clicking on it. Okay, and I'm just gonna read out those options for you. So the first option is to a great extent, the next is to some extent, followed by to a little extent, also not at all or do not know. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and read that out for you guys. We really do appreciate your participation. I can see a lot of you have already voted, um, but let me just read this out one more time for everyone. And the question is, to what extent does your organization utilize an effective risk committee? And the options are to a great extent, to some extent, to a little extent, not at all or do not know. Okay, perfect. We really appreciate your participation here, guys. And it looks like the majority of you have voted. So I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and I will share those results. Okay, so it looks like we have a tie for first place with to some extent with 31% and not at all also with 31%, followed by to a little extent with 22% of the vote. And then we have to a great extent, which is 9% and do not know at 6%. So I'm going to go ahead and close off that poll. Sarah, any thoughts on those results? 
So it's interesting to see a split there between, you know, some people who, yes, have got it and others who haven't. I suppose um, great for those companies that have got a um, risk committee and hopefully some of the benefits I've just talked about, are, you know, they're finding similar benefits. I would encourage those who don't know to go back and actually ask that question because there might be something there that could be really well utilized. So it's interesting to see a spread and hopefully some of the things I've talked about will encourage people to go back and either find out the answer or potentially look to implement their own risk committee. Okay, so the third challenge that I talked about at the beginning was around cultural change. So for me personally, there was a real mindset here and this process was never going to be effective unless we actually got people thinking and managing risk in a different way. So some of the things we did to try and overcome this and really embed that cultural change. So we made the decision to pilot the process in two trials and then launch it to new and existing trials. So we picked trials that were in different countries and that were at different stages so that actually we could ensure we had advocates to support in different locations. So with these trials, we spent one-on-one -on -one time with the CPMs and their core project teams, and we really spent time supporting them to identify their risks and complete the risk register. So this also helped us because by working through this early, it allowed us to tweak the process and the tool using their feedback. So it really helped us to ensure that this tool was compliant, but also that it was fit for purpose. We utilized feedback from this group um, who had been involved and we really encouraged them to act as advocates. So to talk up at training sessions and tell people what it was like to go through this process. But we also really asked them to be honest we didn't want people to think this was going to be, you know, a really easy fix. We wanted people to say, this is honestly how I found the process and this is the support available. So we really found that by having people that could talk honestly and positively, that it really provided support and reassurance to those who were maybe a bit skeptical or who were nervous about the change. So during each training session and each big round of communication, we constantly discussed why we needed to embed this new process and the benefits. So the first one that always springs to mind is around regulations. And yes, that's absolutely paramount. But we also wanted to talk to people about how managing risk could, you know, avoid uncertainty and actually put the focus back on the aspects that were critical to patient safety and data integrity. We also made the decision to use past events that we felt like people could really relate to. So we talked about at inspection time when there was lots of firefighting and people running around to sort out issues. And we got them to think how different that might have felt had they have been proactively managing risk in this way. So we really tried to make it personal so that it brought risk management to life. We encourage senior leaders to share their views, celebrate successes, and also reinforce key messages. So we really wanted senior leaders to be visible and actively sponsor and set expectations for proactive risk management. So, so for example, we invited um, the clinical operations director to some of our workshops and we asked him to you know, set his expectations. What is it that he was looking for? And it also gave him an opportunity to answer some of the questions from the team. In the real world, senior leaders aren't always available to attend workshops, so we utilise video messages so that leaders could still show their support and still talk about what proactive risk management means to them. As there's such a need for this change in culture, we've really encouraged senior leaders to actively celebrate proactive behaviour and you know, be proud to openly praise those that have really embraced the new change. We also included the clinical operations director within the responsibilities on the SOP and developed a really clear escalation process to provide insight of the risks across the department. Risk management's now a standing agenda at the leadership meeting, and that's really putting risk management at the forefront of people's minds. We also held face-to-face -face, uh, focus training for the CPM, so both in the UK and in America. And we did this because we really wanted to ensure consistency and we wanted the opportunity to be able to set clear expectations with them around what their role was in this process. 
it also allowed them to voice some of their concerns and for those who had been involved in the process they could share their experiences we really encourage debate at these sessions you know we wanted people to discuss their feelings and we wanted them to feel as though we were really listening to them we sent out feedback forms after both our sessions and this helped us to understand what else we needed to do with teams but it also allowed us to develop a you said we did document so people felt that although their feedback or their question might not have been answered on the day we were considering it and we were doing something about it and we're also holding drop-in sessions throughout june so that people have the opportunity to come and ask us individual one-on-one -on -one questions as they start to use this process So that's the three main challenges and the strategies that we use to overcome them. So just to round up, I wanted to summarise the main benefits of this project. Probably the most obvious um, is the regulatory compliance with E6 R2. Risk is now being managed in a consistent way across the department and there's this clear escalation route up to senior leadership. By ensuring that risks are prioritised, teams can really focus their time and effort on the critical risk and ensure that they always have this clear focus on the critical to quality attributes. By moving from a reactive to a more proactive culture around managing risk, teams aren't spending excessive time on managing issues retrospectively. And I think for me, the final benefit is probably the most important. So risk management is really at the forefront of people's minds. They understand why they need to manage risk in this way, and they've got a really clear process framework and the tools to allow them to do this effectively. So hopefully what I've talked about has proved useful in explaining how um, we work to overcome the main challenges. I'm now gonna hand over to Chris, and he's gonna talk you through his case study. Thank you, Sarah. I think one of the biggest problems with risk management in pharmaceutical industry is that we've been used to checking and verifying everything 100 percent and obviously the risk-based approach is that we only apply proportional effort to it the industry is very good at managing issues deviations and quality events what it's less successful at doing is preventing the issues in the first place so our second study looks at a company which has approximately 30 protocols in the portfolio the approach to our bqm is not consistent but the organization has a good SOP in place and working practice document to guide the facilitation of risk management. The first question one must ask is if we have an SOP in the work practice document, why is the organization not compliant with the guidelines? Well, that's probably for a number of reasons and mostly to do with engagement and culture. So we'll discuss in this presentation around that and the, the risk management culture was not mature and requires a push to re-engage interest and partly because there's been a high turnover in quality in the quality function we need to re-establish risk management as Sarah has done in the forefront of um, the organization's quality mind. The main objectives therefore was to create a clear and sustainable approach to risk-based quality management at study and system level in order to get the compliance. Define an approach for quality operation leads to facilitate RBQM for each of the study phases. Create a robust set of tools and rules for training and facilitating RBQM. And develop a system for setting, reviewing, and reporting quality tolerance limits and metrics. And establishing the tools for reporting and communicating those metrics to governance. Our next live poll question, please, Tegan. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch that there. So this is the second poll question and our final poll question for this webinar. So we do appreciate your voting here. Okay, the question that we would love for you guys to answer is, in your organization, how many recognize that the RBQM process is inconsistent despite having an SOP in place? And the options are, SOP exists and organization is consistent in executing RBQM, SOP exists and organization is inconsistent in executing RBQM. There is no SOP. RBQM is carried out inconsistently. There is no SOP and no RBQM or do not know. 
and I appreciate you guys getting your votes in there. I can see you slowly but steadily voting, so I'm just going to give you a few more moments. I know this one is a little bit longer, so I'm going to go ahead and read that out one more time. Again, all you have to do to vote is just go ahead and click on the option that makes the most sense to you. Okay, so the question is, in your organization, how many recognize that the RBQM process is inconsistent despite having an SOP in place? And the options are, SOP exists and organization is consistent in executing RBQM. SOP exists and organization is inconsistent in executing RBQM. There is no SOP. RBQM is carried out inconsistently. There is no SOP and no RBQM or do not know. Okay, guys, it looks like most of you have gotten your votes in and we really do appreciate your participation here. So I'm going to go ahead and close off that poll, uh, off the poll and I'm going to share those results. Okay. Looks like we've got lots of different results here. Okay, with the largest percent of the vote was 30%, and that is SOP exists and organization is inconsistent in, in executing RBQM. And it looks like we have a tie for second place again. With 21% uh, voted, there is no SOP. RBQM is carried out inconsistently, and that is also tied with do not know. Okay, and then that is closely followed by SOP exists and organization is consistent in executing RBQM. That's 15% of the vote. And with 12% of the vote, there is no SOP and no RBQM. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and hide that. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for your participation. I'm going to hand it back over to Chris. And Chris, any thoughts on those results? Yeah, thanks, Tegan. I think. Any attempt at risk-based management is good. Inspectors are looking for evidence that risk management is taking place according to the guidelines. But it's down to interpretation as well and how you do that, and you have to explain that. Our experience is that to get this established in the organization, we have to consider how we approach it, how we engage the organization in conducting risk management, and doing it at the right time in terms of assessing, identifying, reviewing risks. So it's not surprising that I see that larger percentages of the inconsistency around risk-based management, but at least you're doing something. But we can make it better. And hopefully the next part of the slides will show you how we made it better within this organization. So in order to focus your organization, it's important that risk management is a focus in the corporate objectives. We have to bring it to the forefront. And the strategy map here shows how we approach the process from training at the bottom and learning and growth and driving it through the process, driving it through to the customers, and then driving it in terms of corporate objectives, compliance, quality, and having positive outcomes. The foundation of the system is really around learning and growth. And that is about changing the culture making the people aware, communicating correctly, as illustrated by Sarah's case study, and making sure you have the right charters, right steering committee, right forums in place, to make sure that the processes that you've put in place are consistent. This will drive satisfaction for our customers, our study teams, the steering committee, global project teams. They therefore become more engaged, and as a result, the organization as a whole begin to meet their objectives more efficiently and more effectively as we go forward. One of the problems we had was actually clarifying the guidance because, again, it's confusing. There's different guidances which come at different times. And we had ICH Q9 and ICH Q10 and ICH E6. And they've all been issued at different times and they sort of overlap. So what we tried to do is ensure that we clarified this so we had a very clear view of what ICHE 6 R2 did. So ICH Q8, pharmaceutical development, that talks about quality by design. And uh, there was some confusion about whether we're doing quality by design or whether we're doing risk-based management or whether we're doing CTQ metrics. And quality by design established by Duran in the early 90s talks about critically, critical quality attributes and target profile, and it's about developing the product. CTQs is a Six Sigma term, critical to quality. Some companies use it, some companies don't use it. But when I looked into this, we were defining risks with CTQs, 
and there was an element of overlap with quality by design. So we needed just to clarify that in terms of risk-based management, that we just pulled those two apart and make sure that we had risk management from ICHQ9. This enabled us to have quality control and quality improvement. Risk is all about control and improving quality. Again, overlapping with quality by design, but very much highlighted in ICHQ9. And then along came the ICHE 6R2, which introduced the concept of QTLs, quality tolerance limits, and I'm getting confused just talking about it. So it can be confusing when you're not very clear about where ICHE6 sits. And then finally, we had ICHQ10, which is all about your quality management system and making sure that you are continually improving and controlling your quality throughout the organization. So this sort of clarified the guidance for us to ensure that we knew actually where E6R2 sat and how it linked to Q8 and Q10 and being able to drive our methodology forward in risk-based management. So in demystifying that, we could say that our protocol development had elements of quality by designing, had risk-based quality management involved. And it's very important that we do risk-based management throughout the protocol development, and not wait until the protocol is finalized before you start thinking about risks because by thinking about it beforehand, we obviously can design out the risks in the protocol. If it's much harder to uh, design out the risks if you actually finalize the protocol and you're starting the study. And we've seen evidence here where um, studies have been stopped because risks haven't been fully recognized and that causes more cost, more delay, and impacts your, your operations. So quality by design, critical to quality requirements, risk-based management, critical data and processes. Okay, It can be confused, it can overlap, but we're both looking at patient safety and rights, data quality, integrity, regulatory and compliance. But we have to be specific about risk and what we're targeting and the areas we're looking at, whether it's in the quality and the design of the product or the IP itself, or whether it's actually the data and processes that's driving the clinical trial to meet the needs of the organization. We can have CTQ metrics if you want, but we must have QTLs. QTLs are part of the compliance and have to be reported. And we have to report not only the QTLs, but whether we deviated from them and how we deviated and what actions we took in order to bring them back in line. So very important that we had that very clear move away from our CTQ metrics, which had a place in some areas, but for compliance, we had to start talking about QTLs. Just an example, CTQ, serious adverse events are reported in a timely manner. That's what we need to do. That's the objective where the number of serious adverse events not reported in 24 hours suddenly becomes quite critical because then you're trending towards outside your limits the tolerance and therefore your risks start to become issues. So engaging the study teams. Having completed our gap analysis of the organization process, tools and the implementation of the risk-based quality management that existed, it was clear that one of the biggest challenges was engagement of the R&D organization. Whilst it was clear that we, this should be an activity that needed to be completed, it was lacking continuity, rigor, consistency, pretty much what we've seen from the poll in its execution. So we had to eliminate pointless administration and we had to try and think about how we automate the task because part of the engagement is the boring approach of looking at spreadsheets and the approach of going over and over again the risks and trying to get 20 or 30 people in the room at the same time. We looked at the business requirements that were documented, we interviewed stakeholders. We wanted to start thinking about promoting the positives of risk management. You know, not fighting issues all the time, but eliminating issues. You know, making clinical trials more effective, okay? And ensuring that we designed out risk at the earliest stage during protocol development 
rather than reacting once the study was in trouble. Again, we also look what other father companies are doing. It's always good to look around what the bigger companies are doing. We looked at what other industries were doing. Part of our um, opportunity here at Chaucer is that we work in many industries and we see risk management from all different perspectives. So that helps us in, in order to help design our process going forward. And again, as Sarah has um, already said, communication. Communication is key. Right from the top level, all the way through to, to the study teams, all the way through to the CRAs, to the sites, and everything, to your vendors. Make sure your vendors know what we're doing. We found a big overlap in what the vendors were doing in running our clinical trials and what we were doing. And it wasn't truly aligned, to be honest. So we had to make sure that we were communicating to the vendors what we were doing and how we were doing it and our requirements for them. So, we ended up with having a driving approach, identifying roles, identifying roles for delivering risk management. We had our risk cast, our champions, our agents, our sponsors, and our targets. We designed a six-month program, agile, fast reporting, quick decision making, and we're currently implementing that as we go through. We wanted to eliminate duplication of risk activities. As I said at the beginning, if you look into your organization, there will be lots of functions doing risk activities. Okay, you can use some of those risk activities, especially at the system level, business continuity, vendor risk management, to start to eliminate the need to duplicate that because the information is already there. This too will engage your study teams engage the people that you need to contribute to the risk-based management. And the enterprise must allow for coexistence and multiple frameworks. So good risk management relies on lots of different frameworks, depending on what you're looking at and what you're focused on. And it's okay to have one risk management framework in business continuity, for example, or managing vendors, another one at clinical trials, another one in IT systems. And if you can connect them, connecting all those different modules, then suddenly you've got an enterprise system that's very effective and works together. So we have to look at technology and how we use it. Now, spreadsheets are okay, and uh, you know many companies use them. But we had a technology um, that we could um, use, and we discovered actually improved engagement quite massively. We got a massive reaction when we started this. So the next slide, I'm just going to share with you what we did. So in the world today, in our global companies, we have people all over the globe. And it's always hard, as you guys know, to get everybody in the room at the same time. Very expensive, very time consuming to get 20 or 30 people in one room to do uh, risk brainstorming. So what we needed is a technology that enabled us to do virtual risk brainstorming, and that came in the form of a system called Shark Cloud. <laughs> now, with Shark Cloud, what we were able to do is, is create a form that we could actually send out to all the contributors and all the participants of the meeting, and they could actually add risks. They could identify the category of risk and to descriptions. So we had set up a two-hour session. This form went out to everybody, and within that two-hour session, we had 20 or 30 minutes where we asked people to write down their risks in brainstorming fashion and make sure and send them in. At the, uh, in the master screen, if you like, what we had was a screen, and as people sent in risks, they'd fall into the different categories, as you can see here. So immediately we had vision of what people were concerned about, what people were thinking, and this engaged people because once the first risk had come in, you could see the increase in rate of risk as they came into the system. Virtual, real time, it was there. Behind each of those panels, we could then set up some attributes, some causes, some controls, recovery, mitigating actions, and everything. So when in our system now, not only do we have the risk that's categorized, behind each one of those risks, we have a set of attributes and resources 
to enable us to actually drive into that risk and become have concentrated focused discussions around that risk as as a team. Now some of them were done as a group, some of them were done as individually with SMEs. But very effective and resulting in a really good engagement. And as we do that, we begin to start changing the culture and the view of risk management because we have something that works quickly and efficiently. In terms of reporting, the system allows us to report in risk matrix. It allows us to identify where the risk sits in our scoring, whether it's with risk scoring, occurrence versus impact or detectability. It allows us to create relationships. The white lines that you see on here are relationships between risks. And also you can see that the dark blue here is our threshold. So anything above 100 score are risks that we want to prioritize. So when we come back to risk-based quality management, we're saying we're only going to prioritize our effort on these big risks. We're going to track the other ones, but these are the key risks, critical data, critical processes that will affect or may stall our study going forward. So they're the ones that we're going to focus on. We've got proportionate amount of effort and therefore, we are now suddenly looking at risk-based quality management rather than trying to manage the whole quality of the whole study in every single area. It allowed us to create a risk register. As you can see, very similar to what we have in Excel. But again, allows us to filter. Behind each panel, we have the information. On the left-hand side, we have the relationships. And so Excel-based but also much more interactive and much more engaging. Now, having this engagement, we begin to start changing the culture because it gets people interested. It's efficient, it's quicker, it's productive. And this is a system we're now running and using in order to deliver risk-based management within our organization. So, key takeaways. Managing the changing culture required for risk-based management is key. Okay, real-life lessons learned from the implementation of E6R2 with our case studies. We have proven and we have seen that by changing culture, by getting better engagement, we start driving forward risk-based management within the organization, whether it's a small company, medium-sized company, large company. We clarification of definitions around risk-based quality management is key as well. There is a lot of confusion in there. I think as Sarah has um, said in her case study and in my case study, clarifications and definitions to be clear, make sure that people start getting engaged. Then we can see that technology can be used to improve engagement and effective reporting. The one thing we want to do is slightly semi-automate risk-based management so the effort for the study teams who have an awful lot of other things to do becomes minimal but effective and plenty of communication right from the top all the way through to the study teams below to your vendors to your suppliers to the um, compliance authorities and to the inspectors because they're going to be asking how do you do this okay I think we're now in time for questions Yes. Over to Tegan. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Yes. So we have reached the Q&A portion of the webinar. So it's our opportunity to answer any questions that our audience members might have. I just want to say a big thank you to Chris and Sarah for that wonderful presentation. And while you guys were presenting, we actually got a lot of great questions in from our audience. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with some of those guys. So one of the first questions we got in uh, is, uh, the webinar you used as a reference for case study one, could you please provide the source or reference? So um, that was me that talked about the webinar. Um, so the particular webinar that we used um, is from the Avoca group. Um, so it was actually something that one of our core project teams um, he actually watched it initially and just found that it was really, really good for explaining actually what a QTL was and some of the terminology. So that was just one that we found, but there's probably many out there across the industry. Mm, perfect. I think it's important, though, if I may, I think it's important that we don't mix risk 
risk-based monitoring up with risk-based management. There's plenty of webinars around risk-based monitoring as well. So, so be be careful. Okay, gotcha. Well, I appreciate both your answers to that one. And the next one we have, Sarah, I actually believe it's directed uh, towards you here. One of our audience members wants to know, could we get a copy of this Excel workbook and or the SOP? So, um, as Chris mentioned at the start, obviously these companies have been anonymized um, for different reasons. And I think also the both the Excel workbook and the SOP were very bespoke to that particular company. Um, so it's not something that we could share. However, at the end, um, Tegan will show the contact details. So if you wanted to contact us and you wanted to ask us any questions or if there was any advice we could give around maybe your specific company, absolutely, you know, drop us a line and we'd be interested to know your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, and if we just don't get a chance to get to your question today, we will have some contact info coming up shortly, so uh, the team will try and do their best to get back to you guys. Okay, coming up next, one of our audience members wants to know, when you have an existing process, what is the best way to M risk into an existing well-established process? Sorry, Tegan, just repeat that last bit. Yeah, please. absolutely. Here, I'll repeat the whole thing. So when you have an existing process, what is the best way to M risk into an existing well-established process? Um, I think you have to, we started off with a gap analysis, understanding where the gaps were. So we said there was a very, we had a very clear idea of what the guidance needed. We had a very clear, as you've seen on the demystifying slide of, demystifying risk-based management, understanding then where the gaps were and understanding how we could drive and fill those gaps. Okay, thank you for that answer there, Chris. Um, okay, we've got lots of really great uh, questions coming in from our audience, so we really uh, appreciate all of your participation here, guys. Okay, so we've got another great question here. So someone wants to know, should CROs implement RBQM? We have found many sponsors do not have risk-based management in place. So we um, have found a similar situation. So we found similarly that some CROs haven't necessarily embedded the regulations fully. They should be. And I think what we've been doing is, um, you know, showcasing actually this is what we're doing. Absolutely having those open dialogues with the CRO of this is what we're doing and actually supporting them where we can so that they can embed the regulations as well. And Chris, anything to add there? Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope, you're good. Okay, great. All right, we've got another awesome question coming in from our audience. So actually, someone wants to know, why didn't you use Transcelerate's RACT? That's a great question. And I can address that because we had a very close look at the RACT, as they call it, from Transcelerate. And the RACT itself, if you look at it very closely, is geared to risk-based monitoring and it's not geared to meeting the compliance level of R2E6. We had a good look at a vendor who was using the Transcelerate Act almost to the letter, but it wasn't meeting the needs of our clients in terms of risk-based quality management. Perfect. Thank you for answering that for us there. I really want to thank our audience for all of those great questions. Um, that was a really interactive Q&A and we've got another one that's just come in. Uh, so the question that one of our audience members wants to know is, you talked about using technology to support risk management. How can we find out more about this as a solution? Um, you can contact me um, and, and I'll, I'll gladly run you through it and show you some demonstrations of it. You know, I think there's many pieces of technology out there that try to um, deliver risk management, um, but in terms of engaging uh, and managing risk-based quality management, we found this was very effective. And we did look at other technologies as well. Mm -hmm. But please contact me or Sarah, and we can certainly organize the time to take you through it. 
Perfect. And we, and just as a reminder, that contact info will be coming up shortly. But uh, Chris, this actually looks like it's a follow-up question for you. Um, so I think, hopefully I say it right this time, how is RACT not meeting the requirement? Well, firstly, the RACT that we looked at didn't have evidence and didn't have QTLs in it. It looked at the um, protocol from a scheduled point of view. So the schedule of the protocol is around monitoring and it's around the key monitoring thing. So what it was doing, it was taking risks from the schedule and saying, okay, what are the risks to monitoring? And from the vendor's perspective, that's saying, that's right, because actually our job is to service monitoring. What it wasn't doing is saying, what are the critical data processes of the actual protocol and how we define the QTLs from that? There was no evidence of QTLs, and it was looking at a different perspective from um, what we were looking in risk-based quality management. Hmm. Perfect. Thank you for clarifying that, Chris. And with that, it looks like we have reached the end of our Q&A session. Um, but the good news is if we didn't get a chance to answer your question, as I'd mentioned, go ahead and send that question to the email address that's showing up on the screen right now. I'll give you guys a moment to write that down, info at Chaucer.com. So if there is anything you guys want to know we didn't have a chance to answer today, they may be able to follow up with you there. And I really appreciate um, all of those questions coming in, a really great Q&A session. Okay, so I want to thank everyone who participated in today's conference. Uh, you will be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve any future webinars. You can also share this webinar on LinkedIn and I'm actually just going to send you the link in the chat box now if you would like to do so. I want to say a huge thank you to our speakers, Chris and Sarah. You guys did an excellent job. Uh, we hope that everyone found this conference informative, and I want to wish everybody a great day. Thanks so much. Bye now.